All right, and welcome to uh, Wednesday night Bible study here at Faith and Victory Church. And uh, we are glad to have you with us. And I'm going to go share that we're online. Uh, we should be showing up pretty soon. It's live now. So share it. Turn your volume down. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, did I say faith and victory? I did not. <laughs> I did not. You just you thought I heard. You thought you yeah, I've said it so much you think I said it. <laughs> Welcome to Expedition Church, <coughs> where the life of victory has been forged by faith. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, praise God. We continue tonight with our series from E.W. Kenyon, uh, The Bible in the Light of Our Redemption. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And now that shared this out there, praise the Lord. All right. Um, last week we learned about the new creation and um, what, you know, remember the new creation was to be a love being. It was an issue with him, the law of the new creation. Um, and so we want to talk about this week, the law of love. There is a law of love. Everybody said there is a law of love. Yeah. Hallelujah. Uh, 1 John 4, 7 says this, um, that beloved, let us lo love one another for God, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is begotten of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now this is not, and this is not epinosis. This is a form of gnosis, but it carries more than a mental memorization or knowledge of something. It is um, knowing and uh, acting in regards to that knowledge and obedience. It, it goes deeper than simply, um, oh, yeah, I know them. You know, you just, you know, you know, you can say somebody famous, you've met them one time, I know them, whether you, 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 were, you were acquainted with them on one occasion. You don't really know them, okay? Hallelujah. Um, but, you know, the test of the new birth is love. Uh, 1 John three fourteen. we know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not abideth in death. Now, now we could take this and go the way of, you know, if you don't love, then you're going to hell. But I think this means you're still abiding in the, in the old, unrenewed, unregenerated mindset. Be not conformed to this world. Remember, remember um, the Word of God says? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul wrote to the church at Rome. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, proving what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. We're told to wash, to, to, to um, cleanse our thinking and wash it with the washing of the water of the word. Amen. And so uh, we have to realize that um, you can be abiding in death. You could be abiding in the old man and abiding in the old ways because you don't know God. Not that you haven't been born of God. You're not, you don't know him. You haven't come to that place of walking in obedience and the, not, and the knowledge of his, your relationship with him. And it's keeping you back. It'll hold you back. It'll hold you in defeat. And it'll make you ineffective in the kingdom. Hello. And I believe every believer should want to be effective in the kingdom. Not just, you know, there, but effective. Amen. So, um, <clears throat> when we look at these statements, um, when you love, we know you're begotten of God because of your love. There's old song they used to sing, we are one in the family, we are one in the Lord, we are one in the Spirit, we are one, we are one, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. Yeah, well... <laughs> now, the world will come along and take that narrative and misuse it against you to, you know, say you're not in love if you don't promote or support or um, accept um, a godless worldview of everything on the planet. And that's just not true. But, you know, you can disagree and still walk in love. 
Then when the one, they brought the woman to Jesus who had been taken in adultery, in the very act, where's the guy? You ever thought about that one? Where was he? The, now, church history speculates it was, one of the, it was one of the Pharisees or Sadducees. And they had to, they had to cover up and get rid of the evidence. They're going to stone the woman to protect him. That's how it works, isn't it? Now, <clears throat> Jesus didn't look at her and say, woman, I'm not going to condemn you because there's nothing wrong with what you were doing. Love just says it's okay. Love just says there's not a problem with what you're doing. That's not what he did. That's not how he handled it. Okay? Where are your accusers? They're, they're gone. Neither do I condemn thee. Go your way. But you know what? Go and sin no more. Less or worse thing come on you. Don't. He did not. He did not pat on the back and say it was okay. I'm going to love you. I'll, I'll restore you. But I'm not going to sit here and go, go right ahead, baby. As a matter of fact, next week, why don't you just put a, 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 some cards on the table and advertising your business for all the other guys in the Pharisees. He didn't do that. And we bring him into the church. So we're told today that that's love. And if we accept this type of marriage, which is perverse according to the Word of God, or this type of marriage, or this type of activity, um, if we don't accept it, then we're haters. That's just, the, that's just a lie of the devil. And we cannot be moved by that. No, the love of God, remember God so loved the world? No. We, we love John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's go, for God so loved the world, they run over to Ephesians. That even while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he quickened us together and made us alive together with Christ and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Amen? He sent Jesus because we were dead in trespasses and sin. Not to tell us it was okay to keep living that way. Duh. But, you know, when, when, the, when the devil is trying to um, capture people and place them into the bondage of sin and bring them into absolute destruction and captivity, he'll lie to them. Okay? All right. Now, the word used here for love is not phileo. No, there were there were five Greek words used for love. Four of them used in the New Testament. I don't believe the fifth one was. I'm trying to remember what the fifth one was now. But there was uh, agape, phileo, storge, um, eros, and there was one more. And I, I can't remember off the top of my head what that fifth one is. Uh, I know that um, eros, storge, phileo, and agape are used in the New Testament. Okay? Um, obviously, uh, eros Erotic love, the low, you know, just carnal. I mean, it, 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 without the others, it's just a pure carnal act. And it has, to be, it has to be governed and tempered by the higher love. Storge was friendship. Phileo was brotherly love. Okay? And, the, and at the time that, uh, of, of the writings, the Greeks would use phileo as their highest form of love. But it was still a human love. Okay? It, it was not agape. Jesus took agape and, and, and actually, um, in theological terms, elevated its meaning from its usage to mean unconditional love, the God kind of love. And it took on the, those um, nuances and variances in, in uh, Greek New Testament writing and theology. Um, but up until then, the Greeks used phileo as the highest kind of love. But it was not unconditional. It was still, you know, human love. And we all know this, human love can turn on you in a heartbeat. Now, y'all all, all went through high school, I, I assume. Anybody not go through high school? You didn't go through high school. You missed that. It may have been a good thing, Joe. You, you missed some of the drama. 
the drama, okay? But some of y'all remember that in high school, you'd be dating a girl. Y'all was in love. Y'all in the hallways one day kissing, hugging, holding hands. Everybody, oh, they're such a cute couple. Hello. Are y'all here? And y'all, I mean, just, oh, oh they, they, just all over each other. I mean, sometimes to the point it was just gross. You know? I mean, you know, by the 70s, French kissing became popular out there in the hallway. They were out there, you know, French kissing and all this stuff. All in love. And then they break up. And the next day, they hate each other's guts. Talking, I mean, terrible about each other. I remember one time me and, girl, me and one girl broke up. Now, we're friends on Facebook now. We, you know, we, became, we were friends later on in high school. But when we broke up, I mean, it was ugly. I mean, she had her posse, and I had mine. Hello? And she, her posse was telling my posse all the things she had said about me. And my posse was telling her posse all the things I said about her. And he went back and forth for a while. It, I mean, we were in love one day, and I mean, it was heaven versus hell the next I mean, brr. Now, we, you know, down the road, just a few months later, we kind of reconciled that, and, you know, we were cool, okay? <clears throat> but at the time, Phileo went viral. We didn't need Facebook. We didn't need social media. We had tell a friend. It was all over the school. Are you here? You going home? It was bad. Do I hear somebody's phone with the service on it? Is it mine? Huh? Oh, it was Dick. Guilty. I just want to make sure I wasn't mine. I thought I'd turn mine off. You know, I get in trouble all the time for leaving mine on. Daddy, you left it on again. So phileo is, is not the highest kind of love. It is a human love. <clears throat> but the, the mindset of the people of the day was a phileo love. It was still selfish. It was still all about me. If you injure me, I will retaliate. Okay? So for Jesus to come, he didn't use phileo. For God so phileo the world. He couldn't. Because God's not selfish. And God wasn't going to turn on you and cook you because you made a mistake. All right? He used agape. And um, it seen, it, it, you know, he, he somewhat coined this word, expressed, um, expressed the new law that was to govern the heart of man. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Here, even as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Now, how did Jesus love? He laid down his life. Greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Amen. So now Jesus begins to describe a different love that is not retaliatory, that is not self-seeking and self-absorbed, um, that will not cook you on the pits of revenge, if you cross it, it's a completely different thing. Well, you know, what did Jesus do in, in, in his teaching? If one man, if he smite thee on one side, turn the other cheek and let him smite that one also. If he bid thee go one mile, go two. If he takes, if he asks for your coat, give him your cloak also. Render not therefore evil for evil, but good for good. I mean, good for evil. He's teaching something totally different. You've heard that it said in the law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, oh, now we got a new law. There's a new law. And I like to say this, whatever the Bible said in the Old Testament is still in force unless Jesus overrode it. 
Okay. Well, why don't we follow the law of the Sabbath? Because Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Remember that? Why do your disciples eat the, you know, uh, eat on the Sabbath or do this on the Sabbath? He said, have you not read where David went into the temple and took the showbread and, and, and gave it to his men? And then, then saying, he, he was often saying things like this. You do error not knowing the scriptures. <laughs> Amen. And, and of course, they're going, huh? You know, um, we know them exactly. You don't understand their meaning. The, man, the law was the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Okay. <clears throat> but <clears throat> thou shalt not commit adultery is still a commandment of God. Now, he overrode things concerning the Sabbath. He overrode things, uh, uh, different other things, like eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. He said there's a new law. Love one another. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, Jesus wanted to express something that there was no Greek word at the time to really express. And so he had to take and <coughs> move this word to a different elevation of meaning. And it came out. The love of God, unconditional love. Not I love you because of what I can get. Actually, it's I love you, period. Now, God loves the sinner that goes to hell. There will be weeping in heaven. I don't believe it's going to be the saints. I believe it's going to be God. There'll be weeping in heaven because God gave people the opportunity, gave them everything they needed to not go there, and they still went. I believe God will weep <clears throat> because he loved them. He gave them the means to be delivered, gave them everything they needed, and they still rejected it. Um, there have been no noun, you know, um, there have been a verb, but a noun, and the noun became agape. There's agapos, there's a uh, Agapeo, there's different variants of the verb form and there's noun forms. <coughs> Agape became the noun form. It was not just an action, it was an actual thing. The love of God is, is actually tangible. Well, how do we know that? Well, John in 1 John states that, you know, he says, God is light, God is life. Those are the three, those, we have three themes of 1 John God is light, God is life. God is love. Now he has love. He is love. It's substantive. <laughs> Got tied up in there with those extra T's. Substantive. It is a substance. There we go. I won't get, I won't get myself tongue tied anymore. Okay. And so man was, when he received a new nature, brought into the new family, gave, got a new father, Remember, ye are your father of the devil, the lust of your father you will fulfill. Amen. But when you got born again, you got a new father. Amen. Um, we were supposed to be a new people, a new creation. Um, and have to have a language that fits our kingdom. It's the language of love. Now, some of y'all are old enough around here to remember the Madison street preacher and his son. Okay, and his son was about 12. We go outside the principal's office up there in Madison, that area up there, stand in the principal's office window and scream like his daddy did out on the street corners, Ye generation of vipers and snakes! <coughs> and his daddy would do the same thing on the street corners. See, that's Old Testament. That was the Old Testament evangelistic message. And they were. But Jesus came with a new message. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah, there's a hell, heaven to gain and a hell to shun. But the message, the love, the language of the new creation is the language of love. God loves you. He loves you so much, he sent Jesus to die for you while you were dead in your trespasses and sins to deliver you from your sin, not to, 
not to damn you to hell in your sins, but to deliver you from your sins. Amen. The language of love is there's a way out. Not you dirty, rotten, low-down scoundrel. Okay? There's a new language. There's a new heart. There's new ways. Remember this? After three and a half years of walking around with Jesus, and Jesus and Peter's out, out there when they're around the fire, and they're, you know, Jesus is inside being tried, and they come and say, you're one of them. And he says, no, I'm not. And they say, your speech betrays you. Now, wait a second now. Before then, Peter, and even up until, because the first thing he did after Jesus would die, he went fishing. I go a fishing. Remember that? Peter was a fisherman. Fishermen then are like fishermen today. They're, 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 they don't have a real clean vocabulary. Okay? I don't know what the real bad words was for their day, but I'm sure Peter used it. Okay? I mean, we have we, our, our, our new narrative is a certain word that everybody uses it all the time. It's the new adjective for everything. You know? And you got to drop that bomb all the time. And you're just like, is, is there just not another word in the English language you can use besides that? You know? I mean, at least go for doggone. Or dag nabbit. You know? No, we gotta, you got to use that word all the time. All the time. I mean, you can't even describe a coat and a hat without using that. Anyway. I'm sure Peter used whatever. Well, the Bible says after three times, he finally went and started cussing. I don't even know. Why? Because being around Jesus changed his language. Not just he didn't cuss. Are y'all here? It was more than not cursing. He had picked up on the language of love. Being around the master. Amen. Jesus would go and minister to people out of the language of love. I do those things I see my father do. Suddenly, his actions and his language are, are different than anything they've ever seen. He talks not like the Pharisees talk. Remember that? He speaks as one having authority. And, and he didn't talk like the Pharisees. Had different language. He didn't call, he wasn't referring to God as God. <laughs> My father. My father, he loveth for you. He careth for you. There's a whole new language here. Amen. And he translated, when we were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love, and, and that's what it says, we were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the son of his love. Love becomes the central action, activity, language of the church. So we have to love people. Now, part of that starts with loving one another in the church. Now, if anybody in this room grew up in a denominational church, you know there can be a bunch of folk in there who don't walk in love. I mean, like Brother Hagee used to say, they got folks in there who got who can sit, who got a tongue so long they can sit in the living room and lick the spoon in the kitchen. I shared with you last week or week before how all that that rumor mill went started when I was on my way out to Rama, without cell phones. Okay, I think it was the week the power the, the uh, everything was down, so we didn't get it recorded. And what I said that service doesn't need to be recorded anyway. Anyway, <laughs> it didn't even be made public. All right. But this, and then, and then we get a new law, the new commandment I give you. By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. We have to love one another. Loving and caring for one another in the church. Now, think about the importance of that in the church. I'm going to borrow the stool again. If you don't mind, Dick. Yeah, thank you. I asked the first time without, I mean, I borrowed it the first time without asking, but. Um, Think about the importance of love in the church. The care for one another in the church. 
Now, how are we going to care for the sinner that walks in if we can't care one for another? Hello? And you got churches that are full of competition. I re oh, gosh, I remember it. Back, you know, now I was young enough that they wore hats. Yeah, some of you women remember wearing hats to church. Rita, you don't remember wearing hats to church? Mama did, okay. She bought that hat because she knew I had it. She went out and bought that dress after she saw me get it. Our ride home from church was the critique gossip session about what went on in church. And it won't good. It wasn't about the move of the Spirit. Hello. There was this competition that was always going on and vying for um, hierarchy inside the local church somewhere. My whole life. That's how we ended up with church splits. Now, my family was part of the church, one of the church splits. And that church got out there, and the, and the denomination gave them a pastor. They built, you know, had rich families, and they, they helped fund and build the building because they were, they were construction people. And the, so they built it at a lower price and built the, the, built the church. It's no longer with the denomination anymore. Um, that church had a spirit on it day one. And I remember when we left the other church, we went and met in a school for a little while, and then they built the building, we moved in, and then the pastor's wife and uh, him divorced and um, they brought it. He was a young, young graduate of our uh, denominational Bible college down in uh, Georgia. And then, you know, sent in a couple and sent, and finally sent in one who was, who was uh, shacking up with women in the church. And the denomination finally said, because they, they couldn't make them happy no matter who they put in there. They couldn't get a preacher that made them folks happy about nothing. And finally, the, the denomination told them, we ain't giving you another one. You're stuck with this one. Until they killed the church. They were just some honorary folk. Backbiting competition. Whose family had the biggest name? And I mean, I mean, underhanded stuff. I, all the time. People going around, sitting around the table, talking about who tithed and how much. Because they, they got information because somebody was in the office or whatever. And who was given how much and all that kind of stuff. That's nobody's business. Hello? It ain't nobody's business how much um, Jaheen gives this week. But it better be $1,000, I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> it's nobody's business. I mean, that kind of stuff going on and fighting over this one and fighting over that one. And then when that church finally kind of just blew up, People went over to, and, and when I am, um, I'm talking, I know I'm talking about my subject now. I'm not just rambling. I, I had grown up, but then when I got um, in college and started work and started um, college and started working on Sundays at Parker's, I worked, I, I worked all Sundays. So I didn't go to church for a while. Now, a couple of three years, a couple of years, I just didn't go to church. You know, I grew up drug to church because, you know, we got, we got to look good as a family, you know. You got to sit there and look good and make mama look good and make them look good in front of everybody else in the building. And you couldn't stand the people you were in church with. Hello? You knew at home that mom, my mama was talking about their mama. And the kids weren't as bad. We weren't, we weren't like we hated each other, but you know, they knew what was being said about each other's families. You know? And, and then this half, this half over here is all related to each other, so they're all on one team. And all the outcasts are over here. And uh, you had the gospel trios all competing so who could do a better job this week. And then they would criticize the flowers. Now, if you've ever been in a denominational church, you're appointed when you're bringing flowers for the front of the church. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Joe, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. This week, and it'd be in the bulletin. This week we want to thank so and so the such and such family for the for the uh, the, the floral arrangement. Next week such and such family's bringing theirs. 
Well, if it didn't, and, and so then it became a competition about who could get the prettiest and the biggest. Well, you got families that couldn't afford to do it. And then you had rich families who could just, I mean, go all out and make sure they. Well, when I got old enough, I stopped going. I wonder why. Hello. And uh, in the interim time, my family left that one and went back to the original church of that denomination in the town. And was, we're going to church there. When I got when I got, got the Lord started dealing with me, I started going on to Sunday school. And you know what got me was Brother J. Melvin Moore. The, that one of the most loving human beings you will ever meet. And he's gone home to be with the Lord. But that man was walking love. And I didn't go to the young adults class, which was what I was aged in. I went to his, the older folks, because he was so full of love. You just wanted to sit around him because he just loved on you so much. I mean, that won me over because I had never seen that. All I had seen was bickering and backbiting and junk in the church and the gossip and the running this family down and then that family running our family down and then they having all these almost all out wars over, over uh, the covered dish dinners. You know, we had homecoming. Uh, we had homecoming back then. Okay. And, you know, everybody tried to outdo, outdo each other at homecoming. Who could bring the biggest meal? And who could bring the meal that everybody talked about the most and all that kind of stuff? Quite frankly, I don't care if y'all do that as long as we get a lot of food here. <laughs> okay? And his love touched me in a way nothing else ever had. Now, I've been at the altars and had the old saints praying over you and heaven coming down and touching you, but I never encountered the love of God that way. That was new. And it, and I, it started drawing me. And I, you know, I, I asked, well, what should I read? He knew I was seeking God. <laughs> he was an old saint. He'd been around. He told me to read with John and read, you know, read, read the Gospel of John. I threw in Revelation on the side. I said Sunday. It would scare the Hades out of you. <laughs> and, um, but his love, I'll never forget the day I came to the altar and, and got born again. And then four nights later, I came back and got baptized in the Holy Ghost. He got, he was, he was, he was an overweight man. He got down in the floor and just hugged me and loved on me. I'm laying in the floor speaking in tongues and, you know, and all this. And he's just laid there just, just embracing me and loving on me and, you know, uh, and just crying about the fact that I had come to the Lord and got baptized in the Holy Ghost. I would never known that. See, the love of God, the love of God will touch people. When you care about them, not the truth. Yes, listen. We have to preach the truth and we have to stand for the truth, but we have to love people too. We cannot, I mean, I, listen, I get angry. I get a, a righteous anger over the stuff where they're trying to indoctrinate children and, and things because I'm angry at the devil. I'm angry at the work of the spirit of Antichrist that will operation in the earth. Okay? But people are being deceived by the spirit of disobedience, that now, the, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. We've got to love. They've got to know, look, I love you. And like I said, you can look at them and you have, to, you have to say, I can't condone what you do, but I love you. And love is not defined by me agreeing. You know, love is defined by me warning you of the imminent destruction you're headed for if you don't change. And I want to help you change. I, I don't want to see you go to hell. Now, you'll make the devil mad. And they may stir up and come after you. But you still got to walk in love. Amen? All right. Um, on the day of Pentecost, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and soul. And not one of them said that all the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. Now, why, why did they? Why did they do this? Now, some people say that you know it's because they were trying trying to start communism. Um, 
In great power the apostles gave witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Great grace was upon them all, for neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many possessed lands and houses sold them, laid them down, and brought the pieces of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And distribu distribution was made unto each according to as anyone had need. What was going on here? Uh, it was agape. Now understand that when a Jew became a Christian, they were disowned. It was so bad they would have a funeral for their children and bury it, the casket, or bury whatever, and say, my child is dead to me because they had rejected Judaism and became a Christian. The only way for them to survive was to take care of each other. <clears throat> they were not trying to start communism. They were keeping the church alive and keeping it going and giving people a place of safe haven and refuge in the midst of a very difficult circumstance. Can you imagine being dis disowned, disavowed, cut off from everything you've ever known because you made a decision to follow Jesus? And your parents wouldn't even talk to you. They had nothing to do with you. You were dead to them. And the only place to go, the church had to care one for another. Which is why the sin of Ananias and Sapphira was so grievous. Because it was going to interrupt and short circuit this new love that had been brought in by lying about the money. They wanted to look like they were doing it, but they weren't doing it. Hello. And that's why judgment came. Because what they were doing, they were introducing the wrong spirit into the church. That the church was about action, about, about presentation of something and not the heart of the something. They were presenting themselves as caring, but their heart was not there because they kept back part. Now, under deceptive reason, under, they could, like Peter said, you could have come in and said, look, we sold this land for $15,000. We kept seven, but we're giving seven, uh, eight to the church. It would have been fine. They would, no deception, honesty. I'm giving the 8000 <clears throat> I sat in a service for Brother Summerall in 1982, 40 years ago. He was at Rama, and I'll never forget him saying, before the Lord Jesus returns, the day of Ananias and Sapphira will return to the, will, we will visit the church. Why? Because you now have pastors in pulpits who are not walking in the law of love, but walking in the law of greed, self-exaltation, money. I mean, you know, and they're presenting one thing to the people and living another. And if God's going to have his way, his church has to be the church he created it to be, the church of love. Think of Stephen. Amen. Amen. Now, Jesus did not condemn the soldiers that crucified him. And Stephen, the first martyr of the church, as they are stoning him, says this, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. What are we seeing? We're seeing the law of love in manifestation. Not cook them because they're heathens. Send fire down and barbecue them on the spot. No, lay not this sin to their charge. Don't lay the guilt of what they're doing on them. Wow. The Apostle Paul, we said this last week, stated that he would give his own salvation up if it would save Israel. I call that a heavy revy. But when you understand the love of God and you're given to the love of God, you can understand his voice of why he said what he said. Because he loves people like Jesus loved them. 
Amen? <clears throat> this was agape in manifestation as they gave everything to take care of each other. Okay. Um, we've already kind of covered this next part. You know, agape was, was human. It's human, the highest form of human love. Um, agape, phileo is a human love. Agape is a God kind of love. I mean, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, I do like this better in the Amplified. We'll read King Jimmy. And he's going, I got the Amplified. All right, Emmy. Emmy, uh, Emmy. Her, and her, her and her granddaughter look so much alike, act so much alike, you can get them mixed up just about it. You going to let me have your Amplified? I, I said Emmy. I meant e Ellie. Okay, that's fine. We can, we can locate it. All right. First Corinthians chapter thirteen. Paul writes and says this. Um, where? Oh, okay. Oh, I, I see how this works. I had to figure out our Bible. It's parallel. I had to go back another page. Okay. Even if I dole out all that I have to the poor in providing food and I surrender my body to be burned or in order that I may glory, but I have not love, God's love in me, I gain nothing. And that's the sapphire. They gave a lot of money to the poor, but it wasn't out of love. It was out of seeking human recognition for what they did. Love endures long and is patient and kind. You see, a human love doesn't endure. It doesn't suffer. It vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. It's not, um, does not behave itself unseemly. Seeks, it seeks not its own. See, the love of God is seeking the betterment of others. When we in the church are more concerned about the welfare and advancement of others than we are ourselves, then we're, walk, we're, we're getting into the right path. Ministries, we go through this. We go through this in ministry. We got ministers who will, who will come in and take your congregation to build theirs in a heartbeat. There are pastors, if, you went, if everybody got up next Sunday and went to their church <clears throat> and said, we're, we're from Ed Taylor's church, we wouldn't come visit yours, they would do everything in their power to bring you into their church and wouldn't feel bad about it at all. Wouldn't think twice about it because it feeds them. It feeds their vision. It feeds their thing. Well, that's not love. I've called pastors and said, hey, I got people over here from your church. What's going on? Hello? You know? And make them go back and get it right with that pastor before I would let them come over here. Well, you could have built a bigger church, yeah? And brought that spirit in with it. Because how they left is how they come. What they leave with, they bring with them. And if they've got a wrong spirit, they'll bring it right in your place. Be bringing them devils. We don't need them devils. I, 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 I got enough to deal with the devil with, but I have to deal with Christians who got devils in them. You go get that thing straight with your pastor. And if he says it's okay after that, then fine. Okay? All right. Love is never envious. It doesn't boil over with jealousy. It's not boastful or glain voice. It's not vainglorious. It does not behave itself haughtily. It's not conceited. That is arrogant and inflated with pride. It's not rude. Now, I've seen Christians come along with the I'm not the devil's doormat thing. 
Yeah, but you got to walk in love. You can't be a jerk because somebody else was a jerk. Now, people ask me all the time. Because we've had people leave and come back, leave and come back, leave and come back. I've reached out to people who've left and talked about us, ran us down the ground. I've done things for people who they don't know I know what they said in email about us when they left. And I still reach out to them and love them when they're going through a hard time. Let them know we love them. We're praying for them. And get asked the question, how could you do that? Because that's what Jesus would do. That's how Jesus would do it. Because his uh, the love of God's in me. Did it hurt? With, of course it hurt what they did. I'm not, not going to lie about that. It hurt. But you know what? They nailed him to a cross. And Jesus looked at him and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. While they're driving the nails in, and they're mocking him and scoffing at him. Hello? Pastor, how could you call that person after they said this and did that and treated you this way? How in the world? The love of God. They were operating under an evil spirit that was, that was moving them and, and manipulating them. And they've got, to, they've got to know that if they ever are arrested from that place, that there's a place they can come and be loved on even after what they did. Paul said, I'm willing to spend and be spent for the gospel's sake. Yeah, but they did. Yeah, I know they did such as Don't You ain't got to tell me what they did. I know what they did. They did it to me. And it hurt. And, you know, and, and we almost went bankrupt. And we, you know, we cried. And we hurt. Yes, you're human. We hurt. You know, after all the investment and all the time and all the energy and everything else. It hurt. But you still love them. You have to love them anyway. I said, you have to love them anyway. Why? Because that's what the master would do. Amen. Um, so it doesn't act, it's not rude, it doesn't act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way. For it is not self-seeking. The hurt, if you respond out of the hurt, you're self-seeking. You're looking because you're hurt. You want vindication and justification and everybody to know that you were right and they were wrong. Now, I have said some things about what took place years ago in a general topic. I, have not, I didn't tell anybody who they were. I'm not telling you all who they are out here publicly. I could have nailed them to the wall. I could have published the things that were said. I got hard copies of the emails. Hint, if you're going to talk about the pastor and his wife, don't use the church computer. Just saying. <laughs> it's not very bright. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Special Agent Janie Glisson Taylor <coughs> of the CIA. <coughs> we'll find out. <coughs> it is not touchy or fretful or resentful. Amen? All right. <coughs> Takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes that's a work in process in your life. You've got to deal with yourself. And only the love of God can help you overcome that because you want to. Amen? It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness. But rejoices when right and truth prevails. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. Is ever ready to believe the best of every person. 
His hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and he endures everything without weakening. Love never fails. Never fades out. It becomes obsolete or comes to an end. Okay? Thank you, Ellie. Love is ever ready to believe the best of every person. It doesn't fail. Now, that doesn't mean if you love somebody enough, they're automatically going to get saved. It, it means love doesn't go away. That is an enduring, ongoing activity and part of who we are is to walk in the love of God. Amen? All right. And I got to wrap it. So, um, why, is, why is the test of the new birth the love test? Because God tells us in First John, that if a man loves, he is begotten of God, knows him. If a man does not love, regardless of his religious profession, he is abiding in spiritual death and lying, alienating from God. Define phileo and agape. A phileo is human, brotherly love. Agape is divine love, the God kind of love. And what did the disciples first know the meaning of agape? On the day of Pentecost. And then how many wrote your exposition of the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians? That's a zero. You will have that next week, minus 10 points for being late. Do what now? Your dog ate yours. That's 20 points for the dog eating it. Praise the Lord. All right. Praise the Lord. Yep. All right. Real quick, uh, it's time to give. Those out there online, you can give electronically through PayPal or Cash App. Cash App's better. Um, praise the Lord. If you're giving, giving with your check or cash, raise your hand and uh, make sure that Joe knows who you are, where you are, so you can come by and collect that. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless the people as they tithe and give right now. In the name of Jesus, we bless you, them uh, with the declaration that heaven's windows are open and you empty out their blessings they don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, Amen and amen and amen. Thank you so much for giving to the kingdom of God. Those who are joining us uh, on the internet tonight, God bless you. Remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. See you next time here at Expedition Church. Have a great week until then. God bless you. We love you. In Jesus' name.